In this chapter, we'll take a look at upper GI tract disorders. All right, so let's look at the anatomy and physiology just a little bit for the GI tract. So again, this lecture is focused on the upper GI tract, which encompasses the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, and stomach. And then we'll have a later lecture that focuses on the lower GI tract, which encompasses the small and large intestine. Now there's also some accessory organs that are part of the GI tract. So again, they don't directly play a role in this digestion and absorption, but they do play a role in looking at those nutrients. And that's gonna be the liver, the biliary system, and the pancreas. And so the four basic functions of the GI tract is motility, secretion, digestion, and absorption. So here you can see, so again, we're gonna stop at the stomach. So this lecture is gonna be focused on the upper GI tract, but you can see again, so in essence, we're going from mouth to stomach. So the main function of the upper GI tract is mostly motility. So that's the movement of food consumed along the GI tract and peristalsis. So this is the coordinated rhythmic contraction of smooth muscle that forces food through the digestive tract. And so our goal is to move food towards the sites of digestion and absorption, mix foods with digestive secretions, including water, electrolytes, enzymes, bile salts, and mucus, and maximize for the potential absorption. It's so looking at the function of digestion. So complex molecules are converted into their simplest form through digestion. So with carbohydrates, polysaccharides are gonna be converted to monosaccharides, which include glucose, fructose, and galactose. With proteins, polypeptides will be converted to single amino acids and then di and tripeptides as well. With lipids, we're gonna have them broken down into free fatty acids, monoglycerides, glycerol, phospholipids, and cholesterol. So looking at the esophagus, so here we have a tubular organ that's approximately 25 centimeters long and two centimeters in diameter. And it's lined with both tubular and striated muscles and swallowing triggers peristalsis, which is what actually the rhythmically pushes the food down with sphincter muscles at both ends. So we have the pharyngeoesophageal sphincter or upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter. Now the other name for the lower esophageal sphincter is the cardiac sphincter. And you'll notice that when it doesn't work, you get heartburn. So again, it's an easy way to remember that. Now again, remember that 25 centimeters, right? So a ruler is 12 inches or 30 centimeters. So in essence, the esophagus is a little bit shorter than a ruler. So here we can see the lower esophageal sphincter and the stomach go right around the other side of the diaphragm, and this will be important later. And then we have the upper esophageal sphincter and the esophagus for the most part is above the diaphragm. So the esophagus has four layers of tissue that comprise the walls, including the mucosa, submucosa, and the muscle layer or muscularis externa, and the outer layer or serosa. And so again, for the longest time, and I know in hindsight, this seems quite silly, but I never realized it right that the esophagus is a muscle and works just like a muscle. And so, right, it actually forces the food down the GI tract. It's not just gravity. It's not like food just falls down a well. Um, and so we'll talk about this and some of the transit time issues. So here you can see, right, if you're familiar with Star Wars, it looks a little bit like a Sarlacc pit which is what it is, you can see that there's actual muscle lining, right? And so then what this does is this actually will then pull food down into the stomach. So looking at the esophagus, so its chief function is motility as we swallow more than 600 times a day. And now again, so there's four phases of swallowing and this is a very simplified version. Realize that this is an entire class for those that are studying speech pathology. So again, if they tell you something different, listen to them, don't listen to me. This is the best to my understanding of it. But again, this is not my expertise. So you have the preparatory phase where food is mixed with saliva while being chewed. You have the transit phase, which is voluntary movement of the food bolus from the front to the back of the oral cavity. And the pharyngeal phase, this ensures the bolus is directed towards the esophagus and not the trachea. And during the esophageal phase, this is the final phase where the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes allowing food to pass down the esophagus. So the bolus enters the esophagus after passing through the upper esophageal sphincter 
And again, remember, we have peristaltic waves moving the bolus down the lubricated esophagus. So again, you have this, it's kind of like that same kind of whipping motion if you ever whipped like an extension cord to kind of unravel it, where it's kind of whoop and pushing the food down. Food is then passed through the lower esophageal sphincter and into the stomach. And two major neurotransmitters are responsible for allowing the lower esophageal sphincter to relax. And that is nitric oxide and vasoactive intestinal peptide, or VIP. And so the pharyngeal and esophageal phase of swallowing takes approximately 6 to 10 seconds normally and may take up to 30 seconds if in the supine position. So what that's saying is, is that, again, it's not like gravity. You just pour the water down the well and, you know, if you, if you drink something, it goes down your throat in, you know, one second. It actually takes somewhere between 6 to 10 seconds. Now, on the flip side, because we discussed this is a muscular action, you can actually swallow liquids while upside down. Um, it's not super safe and it's not recommended, but it is physiologically possible. Also, because of the muscles, right, this is why astronauts can drink liquids, right? If we were relying on gravity to move liquids down our esophagus, astronauts wouldn't be able to consume liquids, and we know that's not true. So, again, it is a muscular action. So we'll start taking a look at some diseases. So we'll take a look at gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. And so 20 to 40 percent of adults report symptoms of GERD at least once a week with 2 to 20 percent of children having GERD. And so GERD occurs when a reflex of gastric contents enters into the esophagus and overwhelms esophageal protective mechanisms. Now some amount of reflex is normal and occurs daily, but again this is the more extreme variety that does cause pain and some problems as we'll take a look at. So the pathophysiology of GERD is complex, so again why it's actually happening. So the most common underlying mechanisms, though, are thought to be reduced lower esophageal sphincter pressure, or, right, so the valve doesn't stay closed as much as it should, inadequate esophageal tissue defense, direct mucosal irritants, decreased gastric motility, and increased intra-abdominal pressure. So factors that can lower or relax the lower esophageal sphincter pressure, right, so the amount of force it takes to open it, are hypersecretory diseases such as zollinger ellison syndrome, so this is increased secretion of gastric acid due to the presence of non-B cell endocrine tumors. The presence of a medical condition such as a hiatal hernia, scleroderma, or obesity. Smoking. Uses of medications including dopamine, morphine, theophylline, muscle relaxants, and NSAIDs. Consuming certain foods high in fat, chocolate, spearmint, peppermint, alcohol, and caffeine. So again, right, the whole thing, if you've ever heard, right, is that peppermint tea can help uh, ease an upset stomach. And so what it does is it does cause things to relax. But too much of it can cause the GI tract to relax too much, and then the lower esophageal sphincter will actually open and leak stomach acid. So symptoms of GERD include reflux of gastric secretions and, of course, heartburn, which is that burning sensation from the stomach acid actually eating away at the esophagus. Increased salivation, esophageal spasm, belching, pain radiating to the back, neck, or jaw. In severe cases, aspiration of the gastric contents into the lungs. And pharyngeal irritation with frequent throat clearing and hoarseness. Children, right, because they have different length esophagus, are going to see some different symptoms. So they may see vomiting, dysphagia, and refusal to eat and complaints of abdominal pain. So again, while we would normally, what, what we'd have or experience is chest pain or heartburn, but instead, right, they're more likely to experience abdominal pain. Now, prolonged acid exposure can result in esophagitis, which is inflammation of the esophagus, esophageal erosions, ulcerations, perforations or strictures, scar tissue development, and trouble swallowing. So acute esophagitis can be caused by reflux, ingestion of corrosive agents, viral or bacterial infections, intubation, radiation, or isonophilic infiltration of the esophagus. And irritants such as smoking and the use of aspirin or NSAIDs can increase the risk of esophagitis. Symptoms of esophagitis and GERD may impair the ability to consume adequate diet and may interfere with sleep, work, social events, and overall quality of life. So looking at hiatal hernias, so this is the condition where the upper portion of the stomach protrudes through the esophageal hiatus into the thoracic cavity. This is a common contributor to GERD and esophagitis, and the incidence increases with age. 
also with obesity or pregnancy due to intra-abdominal pressure increasing, and this may need surgical repair. Now there are two types of hiatal hernias. You have the sliding hernia, where both the lower esophageal sphincter and a portion of the upper stomach protrude through the esophageal hiatus or diaphragm. This is the most common form. And then type two, which is the rolling or paraesophageal hernia, the lower esophageal sphincter remains below the diaphragm, and this is less common. So here you can see again how it protrudes through the diaphragm. And again, here we can see, so it depends on which portion. So you have the sliding versus the rolling. So again, depending on if you have the sphincter or not. Looking at Barrett's esophagus, this is a precancerous condition in which the normal squamous epithelium of the distal esophagus is replaced by an abnormal columnar epithelium known as specialized intestinal metaplasia. This is a complication of GERD. So again, GERD is just not inconvenient heartburn. It does lead to more severe diseases later on. So 5 to 15% of patients with GERD have Barrett's esophagus. And these patients are at increased risk for adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. And doesn't really have any specific symptoms. Risk factors include GERD symptoms for more than five years, being of the white race, being male, being older than 50 years of age with a family history. And this is detected during biopsy as part of an upper GI workup. So looking at the medical and surgical treatment for GERD, so we have three goals for treatment, which is increasing lower esophageal sphincter competence, decreasing gastric acidity, and improving clearance of contents from the esophagus. And surgery may be needed if the patient's unresponsive to medications. We also take a look at lifestyle factors, which includes smoking, medication use, obesity, and diet history. Other recommendations include raising the head of bed, sitting upright after eating, avoiding tight-fitting clothing, and avoiding frequent bending over. So looking at our medication classes, so we have proton pump inhibitors. These decrease acid production by the gastric parietal cells and are the most effective. We also have our H2 receptor antagonist and antacids for the more mild forms of GERD. And the goal is to raise the gastric pH above four during periods when reflux is most likely to occur. So this is still right below seven, so it is acidic, just less acidic. And we have prokinetic agents, which work to increase the propulsive contractions of the stomach and may be used in persons with delayed gastric emptying. So in essence, this helps push food all the way down. So here again, you just have kind of a cheat sheet for the classes of medications, as well as the generic and brand names of these medications. Now looking at diagnostic testing for GERD, so we do have our esophagogastroduodenoscopy or an EGD. And so if we look at this, and depending on how much time you've been putting into your medical terminology, we're going to go down the esophagus, through the stomach, through the duodenum, with a scope, esophagogastroduodenoscopy. So we use a fiber optic endoscope with a small camera that's inserted down the throat and moves through the esophagus and stomach into the duodenum. This is performed by a gastroenterologist. And again, we do use the, right, the clear liquid diet beforehand and NPO for six hours before the procedure to make sure that you don't accidentally vomit during the procedure. And a biopsy can be done during this EGD where they'll take scrapings of tissue if they need to analyze it or there is concern. So here you can see the EGD. And so again, remember we're going down to the duodenum. So we're really not going that far down in the grand scheme of things. But we can look for ulcers, we can check the esophagus, right? We can check for cancerous tissue or precancerous tissue, etc. Now, if the GERD is severe enough, we also have a surgical option, and this is known as a Neeson fundoplication. So this is a surgical procedure to treat GERD, and so we wrap the fundus of the stomach around the lower esophagus, which provides extra strength to the lower esophageal sphincter and helps prevent reflux. And so this is a laparoscopic procedure and it's for the 5 to 10% of GERD patients that don't respond to other medical therapies. And so here you can see, in essence, is we take the top portion of the stomach, and in essence, we wrap it like a scarf around the valve. Now, in essence, what this does is this is artificially strengthening the valve to help prevent it from leaking acid into the esophagus. Now, here we can see some of the guidelines for reducing GERD. Um, and again, these are pretty general, and that's kind of the problem, right, is that we have specific trigger foods with each individual, um, but they usually fall into these categories. So that's high-fat meals. So for some people, that's things like french fries, 
Um, that's things like fried uh, fried chicken, fried fish, um, right? Any of these uh, any of these rare, very very rich foods like macaroni and cheese, right? Things that are very high in fat. Avoid eating at least three to four hours before lying down. Avoid smoking and avoid alcohol. Avoid caffeine containing foods and beverages. Again, this has to do with again the integrity of the sphincter. Staying upright and avoiding vigorous activities soon after eating. Avoiding tight-fitting clothing, so especially things like belts. But still getting a balanced diet and avoiding acidic and highly spiced foods when there is inflammation as they can just be additionally irritating. And losing weight, again, is that abdominal pressure, right? Again, it's putting additional stress on the sphincter. Other things to consider, so looking at nutrition implications, so there might be nutritional deficiencies or weight loss, which is, so when the GERD is severe enough, then people won't eat, then they could become deficient, or if they avoid specific food groups. Again, we want to do a 24-hour recall and get a diet history or a food diary to look at the consumption of foods that may be affecting lower esophageal sphincter pressure or things that are increasing gastric acidity, and of course, looking at lifestyle factors to determine their smoking and alcohol use. And then looking at our nutrition interventions, so again, reducing gastric acidity and exclusions of foods that are not well tolerated or that are lowering lower esophageal sphincter pressure. And again, this is one of those examples where, you know, I hate to say it when they say, when I eat this, it gives me upset stomach. Then don't eat it. Um, but here again, the problem is, is that because it has to do with those reactions to those specific ingredients. And again, the patient may say, hey, I'm going to eat these once a month and just deal with the side effects. And that's okay. Again, that's their choice. But if you don't want to have the symptoms, you need to avoid these foods. Other foods though that can be irritating are things like black pepper. We said coffee, alcohol. So again, these are all things that are gastric acid stimulants. And then again, the other thing that can help is smaller, more frequent meals, where again, we're looking at the amount of pressure on the stomach. Um, and so it's kind of like a pop bottle where eventually it just has to pop. And in this case, it goes into the esophagus. We use a smaller meal to reduce the pressure. So here again, we just have another list of, again, foods to avoid, and then looking at within specific food groups, examples of foods that may cause problems. So for example, fried eggs because of the amount of fat, you can switch to using them with less fat, right? You can do a poached egg, etc., and still have eggs, but without the high amount of fat that's causing the GERD, and so on and so forth. So looking at some other issues with the esophagus, so again, we have dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, and so this can be associated with obstructive or motor disorders of the esophagus. We have odynophagia, which is painful swallowing, or the severe sensation of burning pain while swallowing. And then aspiration is the inhalation of oropharyngeal contents into the lungs. This can lead to a specific form of a pneumonia, known as aspiration pneumonia, and other lung infections. So looking at the diagnosis of dysphagia, so a speech pathologist perform, performs a bedside swallow eval. So again, as we've said, right, there's the experts in nutrition, and then there's the experts in swallowing. And so a speech pathologist can literally just watch somebody swallow at the bedside and have a pretty good idea, and they'll go, this doesn't look right. Now, when they think something is off, what they do is they do an endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, or a quote-unquote swallow study, in which case what we do is they mix barium into foods and liquids, and then use video fluoroscopy to determine the specific site of the dysphagia. So they mix in this barium, they put you behind an x-ray, and then what it is is it's an x-ray video, and so as you drink, they watch it happen. And so here you can see, um, again, I suggest, I would recommend that you click on this link, um, and again, what you can actually see is you can actually see the barium swallow, and so you can actually see then because of the barium's density it shows up differently on the x-ray and you can then actually see where it's going in someone's throat so again we talked about our dysphagia diets looking at in aging so again this is just a review but again our pureed so again this is that moderate to severe dysphagia with pudding like consistency no coarse textures raw fruits or vegetables or nuts again with no chewing required level two was our mechanically altered so this is that mild to moderate dysphagia. So this is used in transition from pureed to more solid foods. Foods are moist and soft textured. Again, meats are ground or minced no larger than a quarter inch. Although you saw with the new guidelines, this is going to be right in that two, that, uh, two to six millimeter, those little cubes. The bread is pureed, pre-gelled, or slurried. And again, this does require some chewing. And then level three was our advanced diet. And so this is for patients with mild dysphagia who are transitioning to a regular diet. 
Again, this was almost completely back to normal with the exception of some common sense. No hard, sticky, or crunchy items. Um, nothing too dry, right? Crackers, um, toast, tough breads, right? Your French breads, anything that's real crumbly, right? Things that could be very irritating. No raw vegetables. And so again, we were using common sense like celery, carrot sticks, right? Are inappropriate. Food should still be cut into smaller pieces, and this does require more chewing. With our liquids, again, we discussed so our thin liquids, nectar, honey, and then pudding or spoon-like. We just need to consider, of course, that if we're asking somebody to essentially eat their water, that there is a high risk of dehydration, and so they are likely to need IV fluids um, to make sure that they not become chronically dehydrated. And so we discussed, right, there are some different brands of thickener, and so we'll take a look more at these when we're back on campus. But again, so we do have our gel-based thickeners, so that's going to be our gums, and they're going to be more clear. And then we have our starch-based thickeners, which are going to be higher in carbohydrates, but they're also much, much more cost-effective. They're much cheaper. So again, they both work. They have their place. Um, there's different brands, but they all have the same principle, um, assuming, of course, someone's not allergic to something. So if somebody's allergic to a specific type of starch, corn, wheat, etc., then they obviously would not be using that brand for thickening their liquids. Next, we'll take a look at alkalasia. So this is a motility disorder resulting in an absence of peristalsis or a weakened peristalsis within the esophagus. So this also results in the loss of the ability to relax the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, we don't actually know exactly what causes alkalasia, um, but we think it might be immune system related. And so the treatments include some medication to relax the smooth muscle and dilation of the lower esophageal sphincter. And we can also perform an esophageal myotomy. And so this is a surgery that divides the muscle fibers of the lower esophageal sphincter, so again, to help it relax. But in essence, right, this is somebody when you swallow and things don't go down. So the implications, right, so if you're trying to swallow foods and they just won't go down, we have difficulty swallowing, vomiting, and substernal pain when we do swallow. Food and fluids accumulate in the lower esophagus, which causes the body of the esophagus to lose muscle tone and stretch. Again, this can result in poor intake and weight loss because in essence, you're able to eat, but you're not actually able to get the food down into your stomach or further digest. So interventions include texture modified diets, increased protein and caloric density, avoiding extreme temperatures and spicy foods, which could then further damage the esophagus by sitting in the esophagus smaller, more frequent meals, and again, hopefully returning to a regular diet within five to seven days after the myotomy procedure. Next, we'll take a look at esophageal strictures. And so narrowing or tightening of the esophagus that can cause swallowing difficulties. So in essence, right, the esophagus is restricted or stricture. And this can be caused by injury or chemical ingestion, such as household cleaners, lye or battery acid severe sliding hiatal hernias, esophageal cancers, reflux esophagitis, peptic ulcer disease, prolonged use of an NG tube, or endoscopic injury. And so again, what's happening here is that the same way if you ever had scar tissue build up, right, if you ever had scar tissue um, from I don't know, any other kind of surgical procedure or a severe cut, except for the scar tissue is building up on the inside of your throat, and it makes your esophagus narrower and narrower and narrower. And so symptoms include trouble swallowing, pain with swallowing, unintentional weight loss, regurgitation of food, and a feeling that food gets stuck in the esophagus. And so I've actually had patients who, uh, after they had an endoscopy, they could they determined it as being, they said, what was the exact surgeon's words, were that the opening through the esophagus was as narrow as a coffee stirrer. So somebody's throat, now again, this is for food, they can still breathe because that's the trachea, but their esophagus was as narrow as a coffee stirrer. So in essence, liquids would slowly drip down their esophagus, but could not, there was no larger of an opening. And so the way this is diagnosed is so an X-ray while the patient swallows barium. So again, we can see where it gets stuck in the throat, a CT scan, and then old fashioned endoscopy, which is a camera so that we can actually examine it. So the treatment, so we can do antibiotic therapy if this is caused by esophagitis. So for example, if somebody has an infection in their throat, um, and so you'll see like severe cases of strep throat and their throat is so swollen they can't swallow. If we treat the infection, then this part improves automatically. Our other option though is esophageal dilation. And so in essence, it looks like um, 
kind of like a like a duck bill and what they'll do is they will actually just insert it into the esophagus and stretch the esophagus open now the problem is it's usually not permanent um, and so repeated dilation may be necessary to prevent the stricture from returning um, and so i've had patients who came in as frequently as every six months they were here to get it dilated again um, but again it, it, it still provides an option for patients so they can continue to maintain oral intake and then proton pump inhibitors so especially if the esophagus is developing scar tissue from stomach acid right from GERD etc we want to make sure then that we stop triggering this buildup of scar tissue and so nutrition interventions include avoiding large boluses of food while still maintaining adequate nutrition so we may need to use calorically dense foods and beverages or supplements preventing weight loss and then typically after a successful dilation the patient can return to a regular diet but the patient may need nutrition support um, so there is a risk of regurgitated food fluid or vomit entering the lungs leading to a choking or aspiration pneumonia and so you know that's kind of the big issue is is that you know even if we return it to normal they still just had a surgical procedure so again you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and look at what's best for the patient next we'll take a look at esophageal trauma so these are major traumatic events that affect the esophagus and these are often caused by chemical burns ingestions of foreign bodies or injury so we have Borhave syndrome so this is a complete laceration of the esophagus and this is associated with alcohol abuse and retching or dry heaving and we also have Mallory Weiss syndrome and so this is a gastric tear that occurs at the gastroesophageal junction or proximal stomach and this is also associated with alcohol abuse and retching or dry heaving and so again they're very similar to each other really the biggest difference is simply where they occur um, with the Mallory Rice being basically at the very very bottom so where the esophagus touches the stomach and then the Borhave syndrome can be anywhere else in the esophagus and so our immediate intervention of course so these these patients are at very high risk they can bleed to death um, so this is in essence this is a, a surgical intervention which is they're going to go to emergency surgery they're then going to end up on the ventilator and they're going to end up with IV fluids temporarily to rehydrate them. They're probably going to have a lot of severe blood loss. So we're going to have to worry about their blood pressure. And then once they're stable, we're going to give them nutrition support. So again, still making sure they meet their nutrition needs as they're not going to be able to consume anything orally through their esophagus for a significant period of time. So again, we're going to start out NPO as needed and then our nutrition support so it could be a gastrostomy tube so a tube into the stomach um, now they may even have a tube into the stomach that's actually used to suction out blood and then we're actually going to be meeting their nutrition needs via tpn or iv nutrition it just depends on the severity and how quickly they were treated they're going to have increased protein needs to heal from the surgery and from the tear itself eventually once they've been extubated we're going to progress to soft foods slowly as tolerated and avoiding alcohol hot beverages caffeine and spicy foods make sure they're able to maintain adequate hydration and monitor the patient for difficulty swallowing and it's very likely they'll need thickened liquids at least for some portion of time during their recovery so looking at esophageal varices and so esophageal varices are essentially hemorrhoids of the esophagus so veins become enlarged and swollen at the esophagus and this is due to portal hypertension so this is an increase in blood pressure through the portal vein due to cirrhosis of the liver so what happens is you'll have these bulging blood vessels in the esophagus and these are very susceptible to hemorrhage and acute bleeding so in essence they're they're bulging they can get lacerated and then you have bleeding in the throat and so again the reason why this is caused is so portal hypertension is a specific form of high blood pressure which has to do with blood going through the portal vein through the liver so when you have damage to the liver um, you have this alternative flow of blood and so you now are having much higher pressure blood flow through the esophagus than should normally be there which is what's causing so much pressure and putting these veins at risk and so again this is a, a severe complication of alcoholic cirrhosis so the symptoms include hematemesis which is vomiting up blood black tarry or bloody stools and so again this has to do with again if the blood is digested and goes through the digestive tract low blood pressure and so again this is because of a loss of blood and fluids rapid heart rate and shock again because the person is slowly um, bleeding to death if, if it's severe enough so diagnosis is we do an endoscopy which is we can take a camera down there and confirm that there are indeed 
esophageal varices that then need to be treated. So our nutrition intervention is five to six small soft meals so we don't put a lot of stress on it. Avoid any raw fruits, vegetables, hard chips, uh, right? This is the infamous tortilla chips, anything that's scratchy or could scratch your throat. Don't eat it because your throat is going to be very raw. Chew food well before swallowing, so no large bites, again, that could be irritating. Adequate fluid, providing prune juice or formula with fiber to prevent straining. So this has to do with intra-abdominal pressure, which is if you perform a valsalva or you really strain or clench while ha having a bowel movement, you can actually rupture the blood vessels in your throat from the high pressure. So we don't want to have any pressure. Avoiding alcohol, and again, depending on the severity, they may need a gastrostomy tube or a feeding tube for a longer period of time. Looking at oral cancer and surgeries. So looking at oral tumor mass, obstructions, infections, or ulcerations, right? These can all result in dysphagia or odynophagia. End treatments may include chemotherapy, radiation, or surgical resection. Again, all of these place the patient at further risk for nutritional issues. So these are things like nausea and vomiting, chewing and swallowing problems, salivation and taste acuity, right? So taste can go down as well as salivation. And patients can also have procedures that can impair eating, such as a glossectomy, which is a removal of some or all of the tongue. So mouth or esophagus surgeries may warrant a PO liquid supplement to help meet needs. So again, even when somebody has these surgeries or these types of cancers, they're actually, and until it's severe enough, right, or they have swallowing issues, are still able to consume things like Boost, Ensure, smoothies, etc. The other types of surgeries that we can see, of course, is the classic things like tonsillectomy. So this is the removal of tonsils due to a high frequency of ear infections, tonsillitis or sinusitis, or enlarged tonsils. And again, MNT includes things like cold, mild flavored, soft, moist foods. And there is a risk, though, of constipation due to narcotic use after any surgery. So then, especially if they're having oral surgeries, it's kind of a twofold issue, which is the oral surgery itself prevents swallowing issues, but then you've got the constipation issues from the narcotics. So that, again, you just have two factors affecting nutrition just from different ends of the spectrum. But hopefully, again, again, because of the mucous membranes, they should recover and the epithelial tissue, they should recover very quickly and should be able to resume a normal diet within three to five days. So looking at the stomach again, so there's a mucus coating from the lower esophagus to the upper duodenum, which protects the mucosa of the stomach and the duodenum from proteolytic action of gastric acid and pepsin, AKA making sure you don't digest yourself. And so pepsin and hydrochloric acid, again, protect the mucosa from bacterial invasion. So again, it's, we want it there, but we just don't want to accidentally digest ourselves. And so hydrochloric acid, again, is gonna be secreted by parietal cells in response to stimuli by gastrin, acetylcholine, and histamine. And pepsin is an enzyme released again by the chief cells in the stomach that break down protein into peptides. So again, it's not doing all of the protein digestion, but it's starting it. And the mucus does actually contain bicarb, which helps neutralize the gastric acid. Again, making sure that you don't digest and burn a hole through your own stomach. So gastric acid, again, produced by parietal cells lining the stomach with a pH all the way down of one to two. Remember, this is quite acidic. This is a logarithmic scale. And so this is composed of hydrochloric acid, potassium chloride, and sodium chloride. And so this plays a role in, again, looking at the digestion of proteins and helps to activate digestive enzymes. And so gastrin here again, so a peptide hormone that stimulates the secretion of gastric acid by the parietal cells of the stomach and aids in gastric motility. So looking at some conditions that affect the stomach, so we have dyspepsia. So this is persistent upper abdominal discomfort or indigestion often felt after eating. And this includes things like bloating, feeling full, gas, belching, nausea, heartburn, and reflux. This can be due to GERD, gastritis, peptic ulcers, gallbladder disease, anxiety, depression, diet, stress, IBS. So as you can see, right, there's a lot of causes for dyspepsia. We also have functional dyspepsia or non-ulcer dyspepsia. So this is persistent or recurrent upper GI discomfort without underlying pathologic conditions. So again, the underlying mechanism is not clear, but this could be a hypersensitivity to acid, abnormal emptying, et cetera. And so the MNT for dyspepsia, again, reducing dietary fat, sugar, caffeine, spices, and alcohol. So it's very similar to GERD. 
Again, smaller meals with a healthy body weight and mild exercise improves digestion of foodstuffs through the GI tract. Again, this is like a, a family walk after dinner. This is not quote unquote exercise. And so behavior management and emotional support can help alleviate stress, which may be another source of the dyspepsia. Looking at nausea and vomiting. So nausea is the unpleasant sensation that there's a need to vomit and vomiting or emesis is the expulsion of gastric contents. And nausea and vomiting can be caused by drugs, toxins, metabolic conditions, stress or extreme emotions, motion sickness, kidney failure, infection, pregnancy, headache, heart attacks, obstruction, AKA everything. Um, so it's not a very good diagnostic criteria. It doesn't really tell us what's wrong with you other than there's something. And typically, right, this is not gonna be nutrition related, so we need to treat the underlying cause. And there are medications or antiemetics that can be used. So um, if it's temporary or we know the cause, then that just may be the solution. This is things like Reglan, Dramamine, Benadryl, Valium, Ativan, et cetera. It all depends on the cause and the severity. Um, so for example, motion sickness, if you're nauseous due to motion sickness, they say, well, get off the boat. Well, I don't, but I don't have that option, right? That's why we have medication. Otherwise though, then, right, if you can alleviate this by sitting in the front seat, et cetera. But, um, you know, again, usually the focus is on the underlying cause with the medications being a bridge to finding that resolution. Now, again, in addition, of course, to the fact that it's very unpleasant, right, prolonged vomiting can have significant health effects, such as ruptures of the esophagus with Borhave syndrome, lower esophageal sphincter tears, vomiting blood, dehydration, acid-base imbalances, malnutrition, aspiration, pneumonia. So again, this is not just harmless, right? So there is a reason that we need to make sure that we're closely monitoring nausea and vomiting, um, especially if it's severe. So looking at our nutrition implications for nausea and vomiting, so we've got, of course, poor intake, dehydration, acid-base imbalances, learned food aversions, and our intervention, right, is gonna to be to minimize the symptoms and discomfort and maintain nutrition and hydration status as best as possible. And so here we have some nutrition interventions that can help reducing nausea and vomiting. So again, we want very mild liquids, right, after the vomiting has stopped. And again, looking at solid foods. Again, you don't technically have to follow the BRAT diet, but things like that are typically well tolerated, so they're still recommended. So continuing with the stomach, we're going to take a look at gastritis. So again, it makes kind of sense where we're looking at inflammation of the stomach but we're gonna go into a little bit more detail. So again, there's two types. So we have acute gastritis, which is rapid onset of inflammation and symptoms. And this is things from severe burns, major surgeries, excessive use of NSAIDs, drugs, food allergens or food poisoning, alcohol ingestion, and then chemical, bacterial, or viral toxins. We also then have chronic gastritis, which occurs chronically over a period of time, including months to decades, and this is usually a sign of an underlying disease such as Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, peptic ulcer disease, or gastric cancer. Now looking at atrophic gastritis, this is inflammation of the stomach with deterioration of the mucous membrane and glands. And so chronic use of aspirin, NSAIDs, steroids, alcohol, erosive substances, and tobacco may compromise mucosal integrity and increases the chance of acute or chronic gastritis. And prolonged gastritis may result in atrophy and loss of stomach parietal cells, and therefore the loss of hydrochloric acid secretion and intrinsic factor. And again, the big focus on is that we wanna be thinking down the road so we can memorize, right, the fact that this has now damaged our parietal cells. But the big thing here, remember, is that hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor, right, needs that acidic medium to ensure that we can create the B12 intrinsic factor complex. So without stomach parietal cells or without enough stomach acid, we're gonna develop pernicious anemia. Next, we'll take a look at peptic ulcer disease. So these are ulcerations of the gastric or duodenal mucosa that penetrate the submucosa. And so the symptoms include upper abdominal pain. It's usually described as a burning sensation with certain foods and this may be relieved with eating or antacids, which helps partially neutralize the gastric acid. But we also have what's known as a rebound gastrin release. And so this causes hydrochloric acid stimulation and then further pain. And so what you're likely to see is the presence of blood in the stool known as melana or blood in the vomit, again, known as hematemesis. And this indicates active bleeding 
of it, the, the ulcer and this is a more severe form. So causes for peptic ulcer disease include H. pylori, gastritis, the use of aspirin and other NSAIDs and corticosteroids, severe illness, gastrinoma, and Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. And so life stress may lead to behaviors that increase peptic ulcer disease, including excessive use of alcohol and tobacco, as tobacco decreases bicarbonate secretion, decreases mucosal blood flow, exacerbates inflammation, and is associated with the complications of H. pylori infection. And so for the diagnosis of peptic ulcer disease, we use an EGD with biopsy, or they can use a wireless capsule endoscopy, which is what you've seen as the infamous pill cameras. And so the treatment is a triple or quadruple therapy of meds, and then possibly surgery, but so for example, patients may actually get two antibiotics and a proton pump inhibitor. So again, we said, so our primary cause of gastritis and peptic ulcer disease is going to be helicobacter pylori or H. pylori infection. And so H. pylori are spiral shaped, flagellated, gram negative bacteria that live under the mucus layer of the stomach and attach to mucus secreting cells lining the stomach. And so H. pylori are somewhat resistant to the acidic medium of the stomach. So again, where most bacteria would be actually digested or damaged by the, uh, the high, the the low pH or the very high acidity that would normally be breaking down bacteria and proteins. Again, they are slightly resistant to this. And so H. pylori causes persistent inflammation, achlorhydria, and a loss of intrinsic factor. So H. pylori causes 70% of gastric ulcers. This is less common though in developed countries with an increased risk of gastric cancer if you've had H. pylori. So 1% of patients who have had Ulcers from H. pylori will develop gastric cancer. And H. pylori is a strong risk factor for non-cardiogastric cancer, so that's the middle and lower stomach. But it may actually be protective against cardiogastric, which is near the esophagus, gastric cancer. So again, we said our treatment is a combination of medications, including antibiotics and a proton pump inhibitor, for a week to two weeks. So here we can see our cells with a normal stomach, and then we're gonna take a look at the different locations for our ulcers. So our gastric ulcers, so these that occur anywhere in the stomach, but mostly occur the, along the lesser curvature of the stomach. These are commonly associated with antral hypomotility, gastric stasis, and increased duodenal reflux, which may increase the severity of the gastric injury. So there's a higher risk of hemorrhage and increased mortality than a duodenal ulcer. So here we can see where, again, along that curvature, you can see the gastric ulcer. So duodenal ulcers are characterized by increased acid secretion, nocturnal acid secretion, and decreased bicarbonate secretion. And so most occur within the first few centimeters of the duodenal bulb, immediately below the pylorus. And the gastric outlet obstruction occurs more commonly than with gastric ulcers. And so again, we've talked about this before, so gastric metaplasia, so this is the replacement of duodenal villus cells with gastric type mucosal cells where that change in tissue may occur. And so here we can see again, so below the pylorus, right, or below the sphincter, which separates the stomach from the small intestine. Again, this is typically where we see duodenal ulcers. So looking at the medical and surgical management, so again, for peptic ulcers, our primary focus is treating the H. pylori with antibiotics and an acid suppressive regimen, that's that proton pump inhibitor. We can use endoscopic and laparoscopic procedures to treat the lesions. Now, if severe enough, partial gastrectomies and vagotomies may be necessary, so actually removal of the damaged tissue. And other things that we see is so protective foods that contain phenolic antioxidants, such as cranberries or ginger extracts, may actually help destroy H. pylori. Now looking at stress ulcers, so um, it's a little more complicated than uh, you know people would have you believe with you know stress ulcers and just worrying about things, but they are a real thing. And so stress ulcers occur as a result of burns, trauma, surgery, shock, renal failure, or radiation therapy. And so hemorrhage or bleeding is the primary concern, as bleeding can be a significant cause of mortality with these types of ulcers. And so prevention efforts are key in critically ill patients to limit hypotension, ischemia, and coagulopathy. So we want to avoid NSAIDs and large doses of corticosteroids, if at all possible, and oral or enteral feeds to increase GI vascular perfusion and stimulate motility. And so what you'll also see is that in essence is that every single hospitalized patient is ordered GI prophylaxis, 
which again is to help mitigate this risk. So you'll see that every G, every patient's ordered some kind of GI medication, uh, usually a proton pump inhibitor. Now looking at the MNT for gastritis and ulcers, so again, we want to evaluate vitamin B12 status due to, again, this deficiency with a lack of intrinsic factor because you need enough stomach acid. And so low acid states result in reduced absorption of calcium and iron as well. H. pylori can cause iron deficiency anemia. And there's little evidence that dietary factors cause or exacerbate gastritis or peptic ulcer disease. And so protein foods temporarily buffer the gastric secretion, but they also stimulate gastrin, acid, and pepsin secretion. So again, they help temporarily, but then there's a rebound effect. And the classic recommendation for ulcers was actually to ingest cream, as the idea was that because of its thick texture is that it would actually coat the ulcer and prevent the damage. Um, but that's not really how anatomy works, and so we no longer recommend that it, as it is not effective. So the pH of foods has little effect as the pH of most foods is less acidic than the gastric pH of one to three. So again, remember this is a logarithmic scale, which means we're going by tens. So if orange juice is 3.2 to 3.6, you know, if a pH of one, you're looking at a hundred times more acidic, right? So your stomach acid is much stronger um, than any food you should be eating. If you're eating something that has the same pH as stomach acid, um, it's probably going to be quite damaging um, to your body, honestly. So the consumption of large amounts of alcohol may cause superficial mucosal damage. Um, again, you're going to get some redness, but again, that's persistent, large intakes of alcohol. Coffee and caffeine stimulate acid secretion, and again, we said may lower, lower esophageal sphincter pressure. Spices may increase acid secretion and cause small superficial erosions, things like chili, cayenne, and black pepper. Um, and curcumin, though, which is found in turmeric and curry blends, may have an anti-inflammatory effect. So looking at some other foods, so green tea, broccoli sprouts, black currant oil, and kimchi have all been found to help destroy H. pylori. Probiotics containing lactobacillus and bifidobacterium are currently being studied for prevention, management, and eradication of H. pylori. Now, there's been no long-term clinical trials with omega-3s or 6s, and overall, a high-quality diet without deficiencies, with adequate fiber, and with avoidance of foods that exacerbate symptoms is what's currently advised. So again, here we can see, so our nutrition therapy for peptic ulcer. So we have our foods that are recommended and foods that are not recommended, again, if symptomatic. So again, there is general guidelines for a diet, but again, it really comes down to if it's causing problems for the individual or not. Next, we'll take a look at carcinoma of the stomach. So this is cancer that forms in the tissue lining the stomach, AKA gastric cancer. Now the problem is, is that most of the time gastric cancers have rapid growth of their tumors, and so it's often too late for a cure once it's diagnosed. Um, and so in 2013, there were 10,990 deaths due to gastric cancer. And treatments include chemotherapy, radiation, drugs, surgery to remove the tumor, um, and again, so uh, there may also involve a gastrectomy, either partial or total, which is the most common treatment, which is, so if I have a large tumor growing in my stomach, cut out my stomach. And so we can do that and we can actually cut out a portion of the stomach or all of the stomach if necessary. So symptoms though include fatigue and loss of strength, feeling bloated after eating, feeling full after eating small amounts of food, heartburn, indigestion, nausea or vomiting that is severe and persistent, stomach pain, uh, and weight loss that is unintentional. Now eventually, right, the more severe symptoms, so at first these really aren't noticeable though, is Aclea gastrica, so this is an absence of hydrochloric acid and pepsin, or achlorhydria, so just a loss of hydrochloric acid, and this may exist for years before onset. So the problem is until the symptoms are really bad, they're not very specific. So then when people do actually go and get it diagnosed, it's usually quite a severe form of cancer. So malignant neoplasms, right, that's the fancy word for tumors. So this can lead to malnutrition due to excessive blood and protein losses obstruction and mechanical interference with food intake. Now, when it comes to preventing gastric cancers, right, we currently recommend so just a consumption of fruits and vegetables and selenium appears to play a role in prevention and overall health. Now, again, looking at causes, though, so H. pylori, again, has been increasingly accepted as an important cause of stomach cancer and of gastric mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, lymphoma or malt lymphoma. And studies have shown that individuals infected with H. pylori have an increased risk of gastric adenocarcinoma. 
Other things that we're looking at, so heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And so these are the chemicals that are formed when muscle meat, including beef, pork, fish, and poultry, are cooked using high temperature methods such as pan frying or grilling directly over open flame. And so exposures to high levels of HCAs and PAHs can cause cancer in animals, but whether such exposures cause cancer in humans is unclear. And we'll talk more about this in the cancer chapter. But really it comes down to right is the amount of exposure or then or the other cooking methods and what's the safest option. So those with increased risk of gastric cancer, it's going to be a diet high in salty, smoked, and pickled foods, a diet low in fruits and vegetables, eating food contaminated with aflatoxin fungus. And so that comes from most commonly you've probably heard of aflatoxin fungus from boiled peanuts on the side of the road. Those with a family history of stomach cancer, infection with H. pylori, long-term stomach inflammation, pernicious anemia, smoking, stomach polyps, being overweight, and alcohol consumption. So again, looking at our treatment for carcinoma of the stomach, this is determined by location of the cancer, the nature of the functional disturbance, and the stage of the disease. So if advanced, inoperable, or terminal, then we're going to honor preferences, tolerances, and comfort. If it's late stages, the patient may only be able to tolerate a liquid diet. And if they're unable to tolerate an oral diet, we may use an alternative route. Um, again, it depends on their wishes, the timeline, etc. And then if unable to feed enterally, we could even do parenteral nutrition, but that's a pretty aggressive therapy. Again, it really comes down to the patient's wishes and the rest of their health issues, etc. So now we'll take a look at gastric surgeries. So for example, these can be required in peptic ulcer disease and does not respond adequately to treatment. This can be possibly, there can be perforations, hemorrhage, or obstructions. This can also be performed for weight reduction. So again, this also can be all of those bariatric surgeries. So looking at our gastric surgeries though, we're gonna talk about is things like vagotomies, vagotomies with pyloroplasties, Billroth 1 and 2, and then the Roux and Y, or gas and the gastric resection. So a partial gastrectomy, so a removal of part of the stomach, and so in specifically we're looking at the gastrin secreting antrum, which is up to 75% of the distal stomach, remember that's the, the part further down. So we have a Billroth 1, which is a gastroduodenostomy. So this is a partial gastrectomy in which the pylorus is removed and the remaining proximal stomach is connected directly to the duodenum. We also have a Billroth 2, or gastrojejunostomy, which is a partial gastrectomy with reconstruction consisting of a remnant of the stomach connected to the first part of the jejunum in a side-to-side -side formation. And so here you can see, because I know just trying to hear that and visualize that, so here you can see that again, for whatever reason, this is peptic ulcer disease, this is gastric cancer, depending on where it's located. Here, you know, we can see that we've actually removed a portion of the stomach and then reconnected, or we have an anastomosis where we've reconnected it with part of the small intestine. Now looking at other surgeries, so the vagus nerve is responsible for the motility of the stomach and the stimulation of parietal cells in the proximal stomach to secrete acid. Now it has some other functions as well, which is the vagus nerve is actually what helps send the sensation of fullness to the brain. But in this case, what we're taking a look at is we're looking at acid secretion. Now what we have is a vagotomy or truncal vagotomy, which is a cutting of certain branches of the vagus nerve to reduce the amount of gastric acid secreted and lessen the chance of reoccurrence of gastric ulcer. So this reduces the acidity of the stomach by denervation of the parietal cells that produce acid. So the parietal cells in the stomach will no longer get the signal to produce acid. A vagotomy with pyloroplasty. So the pyloroplasty enlarges the pyloric sphincter to relax the muscle and widen the opening into the intestine. And a parietal cell vagotomy divides and severs only the vagus nerve branches that affect the proximal stomach where gastric acid secretion occurs. Now you're familiar with the Roux and Y or the gastric bypass because we previously talked about this for weight management. So again, this creates a very small pouch after a gastric resection and connects the jejunum to the upper portion of the stomach. Now again, this is traditionally used for the treatment of obesity, but it can also be used for peptic ulcer disease. Now we also have a gastric resection or gastrectomy, and so this is surgical removal of part or all of the stomach. So a total gastrectomy, again, is removal of all of the stomach, and then this is usually reconstructed with a Roux Y, so again, that reattaching of the small intestine. So here we can see the different procedures. From a visual perspective, we have the Billroth 1 and 2, 
the partial, the vagotomy, the pyloroplasty, and the ruin one. So looking at the nutrition therapy for gastric surgery. So oral intake is initiated as soon as the GI tract is functioning, with small frequent feedings of ice or water initially, progressing to liquids, and then easily digested solids, and then to a regular diet. And the patient may be fed via a jejunostomy if longer periods of healing are required or expected. So here again, we just have a nice set of recommendations that are compact for looking at, again, that advancement of the diet. So from the surgery to then, as we slowly reintroduce food. So looking at nutrition-related complications after the surgery, this can be things like abdominal discomfort, obstruction, dumping syndrome, diarrhea, weight loss, early satiety, malabsorption of nutrients, lactase deficiency, several varieties of anemia, including B12 or iron deficiency anemia, and osteoporosis. So dumping syndrome, and again, we mentioned this is one of these side effects. So this occurs when an increased osmolar load enters the small intestines too quickly from the stomach. And this is a common complication after gastric surgeries. And surgery affects the release of hormones, enzymes, and other secretions. And so the severity depends on the extent of the surgery, as a Billroth-1, for example, has less dumping than Billroth-2. And so the reason why it's called dumping syndrome, in essence, is that the food dumps or enters the small intestine quickly. And so the chyme, right, is osmolar, or in this case, it's hyperosmolar. And so fluid is then drawn in to dilute the intestinal contents, causing cramping, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. And mild dumping syndrome can occur in those without surgery after ingesting large doses of simple carbohydrates, the most famous example being things like smoothies and slushies, which are very high in sugar and can cause this form of upset stomach and diarrhea. So in a healthy person, food will stay in the stomach for approximately one to three hours. Early dumping occurs within 10 to 20 minutes after eating, and symptoms include diarrhea, dizziness, weakness, and tachycardia. Intermediate dumping occurs within 20 to 60 minutes after eating. And so this is from fermentation by the bacteria, producing gas, abdominal pain, cramping, and explosive diarrhea. And late dumping occurs within one to three hours after eating. And this is characterized by vascular symptoms, including flushing, rapid heartbeat, faintness, and sweating. And so here we have, so rapid absorption in the small intestine stimulates the insulin release, causing hypoglycemia, or in this case, what's known as reactive hypoglycemia. So even though you're eating, you actually get low blood sugar. And so here, an example is a nice chart that kind of shows the symptoms and how they occur and which symptoms right, are related to each other. So looking at our nutrition therapy for dumping syndrome, so we're looking at liquids between meals, not during meals, and laying down or resting after meals. Proteins and fats are going to be better tolerated than carbohydrates as they're hydrolyzed more slowly into osmotically active substances, whereas simple carbohydrates like lactose, sucrose, and dextrose are hydrolyzed rapidly. And complex carbs, again, are a better option as, again, they do take some time to break down. Fiber supplements can help to form gels with carbohydrates and delay GI transit. And lactose malabsorption is common after gastric surgery due to lactase deficiency. And so again, especially if we're going to be reducing lactose and dairy products, a calcium and vitamin D supplement. And if there is steatorrhea, which is a form of diarrhea with large amounts of fat in it, then again, we're going to be looking at low fat formulas and pancreatic enzymes to help with digestion. So to give you an example of a PES statement for dumping syndrome, this might be something like altered GI function related to dumping syndrome following meals as evidenced by a history of gastric carcinoma requiring resection of the stomach. So looking at Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, so again, we've talked about this previously looking at other conditions and diseases, but so this is a condition of gastric acid hypersecretion and it has symptoms similar to peptic ulcer disease, but is unresponsive to therapy. And so this is caused by non-B cell endocrine tumors or gastrinoma, and this occurs in the pancreas or the small intestine. And so this is diagnosed by measuring serum gastrin levels. And so normal is less than 150 picograms. And in Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, there'll be 150 to 200 picograms. And so the treatment is proton pump inhibitors and then surgical resection, because again, obviously this is a tumor, so we're gonna remove it. So we'll talk about gastroparesis now, and then we'll talk a little bit about it later when we're taking a look at diabetes. Um, so this is a chronic disorder of gastric motility that's characterized by delayed emptying of either solids or liquids from the stomach. Um, and so again, paresis and gastro, so stomach paralysis or delayed gastric emptying. 
And again, so this is most famously occurring as a complication of diabetes, but they can also be due to recent surgery, end-stage liver disease, portal hypertension or viral infections, and complications of gastroparesis include DKA, infections, and bezoar formation. So symptoms of gastroparesis include nausea, vomiting, a feeling of fullness after eating just a few bites, abdominal bloating, heartburn, GERD, changes in blood sugar levels, lack of appetite, weight loss and malnutrition, halitosis, aka bad breath, and postprandial hypoglycemia. And so the diagnosis is done with scintography. So the patient ingests a radionucleotide labeled meal, um, and for some reason it's always an egg sandwich, so it's a combination of carbs, fats, and protein, and has scintographic images taken over time. And it's usually about a four hour period of time to assess the rate of how quickly food is released through the pylorus right into the small intestine. And so this is the gold standard for measuring gastric emptying rate. So the treatment is prokinetic drugs to enhance gastric motility and increase contractions in the small intestine. The most famous drug being Reglan. The problem is that this isn't a long-term solution as there are some severe side effects, including tardive dyskinesia with Reglan. So again, we can't overuse it. We also use antiemetics to control the nausea and the vomiting. Antibiotic therapy to treat the small bowel bacterial overgrowth. So again, because of the malfunction right of these sphincters, right, there's excessive amounts of bacteria is growing. We can also use what's called a gastroelectrical stimulator device. And so in essence, this is kind of like a, uh, what we'd call an achid in the chest, which is uh, an implanted defibrillator. There we go. And so what this does is this actually shocks the stomach into contracting and forcing food down. So this is an implanted device that then has wires connected to the stomach and it then shocks the stomach at a predetermined amount based on the endocrinologist that then forces the food down by contracting the muscle. Now again, we can change the diet, right? So we're lower in fiber, encourage digestion. But again, currently there is no true cure for gastroparesis. So our intervention is six small meals, controlling blood glucose if the patient's diabetic. Again, it's the neuropathy that really contributes to this in patients with diabetes. Liquids are often better tolerated than solids as they empty the stomach more easily. Chewing foods well, especially meats, avoiding high fiber. Again, it may be more difficult for the stomach to empty or may contribute to bezoar formation. Sitting up while eating for at least one hour after, possibly a blenderized diet if necessary, and even fats, again, in liquid form if necessary. So looking at bezoars, so these are formations made up of foreign matter that do not dissolve easily. They can be made up of plant material, medications, or foreign objects. They usually occur in the stomach, but they can actually occur in the lower GI tract as well. So you have phytobezoars, which are composed of vegetable matter and are the most common type of bezoar. You have trichobezoars, which is composed of hair, and this usually occurs in young women with a psychiatric condition. Trichotillomania, which is when you pluck and then eat your own hair. And there's also pharmacobezoars, which is composed of ingested medications. Um, and so what happens is, is that, so there's some extended release medications. Um, and so what happens is, is, you know, you've probably seen this as like in the movies, especially as they'll have like five pills and you swallow them all at once. That's actually not what we recommend because the pills can actually then stick together um, and they become very, very difficult to digest and they can actually lead to this type of blockage. So here you can see some examples, right? So these are, um, the trichobezoars, so these are hair-based, or you can see the one in the upper right that has the plant fibers. Um, but again, in essence, they become blockages that build up in the stomach. Now, bezoar formation is related to undigested foods such as cellulose, hemicellulose, lignans, and fruit tannins. And so the following foods have been associated with, again, it's not like it's eating one of these or some magical amount causes it, but associated with apples, berries, coconuts, figs, oranges, persimmons, Brussels sprouts, green beans, legumes, potato peels, and sauerkraut. And so symptoms of bezoars include abdominal pain, indigestion, nausea, and vomiting. And so the diagnosis is done with an x-ray of the GI tract. And so the treatment, right, first we can do enzyme therapy to kind of try and digest or break up the clog. We can also do endoscopic therapy, so we can go in there and kind of chip away at it with the pickaxe to try and remove it or as you saw in the previous photos, surgical removal. And so our intervention, of course, we need to figure out is why this happened. Now, again, 
while we're waiting for it to resolve or you're waiting for the scheduled therapy, we still need to provide nutrition. So this may be a liquid diet until the bezoar is resolved. And again, nutrition support, depending on how severe it is, or if there's other conditions, we may actually need to place the feeding tube below the bezoar to make sure the patient is still getting nutrition. And again, this would be through nutrition support in the form of a feeding tube. All right, so let's take a look at some practice questions. So one of the best ways to reduce esophageal reflux is to, and this is answer choice B, avoid eating late evening meals. Number two, the most common cause of peptic ulcers is, and this is answer choice D, Helicobacter pylori infection or H. pylori. Number three, patients with chronic gastritis causing atrophy and loss of stomach parietal cells may have low serum levels of. And this is answer choice A, vitamin B12. And so remember, this is because there is a amount of stomach acid that is necessary to form the intrinsic factor B12 complex. Patients with dumping syndrome should minimize their intake of, and this is answer choice B, simple carbohydrates. And lastly, drugs that increase the risk of peptic ulcer include, and this is answer choice C, aspirin and other NSAIDs. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions.